Welcome to the Branding Room Only podcast, where we share career stories, strategies, and lessons learned on how industry leaders and influencers have built their personal brands. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, everyone. It's Paula Edgar, host of Branding Room Only, where I bring on industry leaders and influencers to learn about how they've built their personal brands using their skills, talents, and experiences to create and amplify their personal brands. I also love to hear about their reflections on other people's brands and what they've done and what they shouldn't have done. So we'll get into that in a moment. Today, I'm super excited because my guest is Conway Ekpo. He is the Director, Associate General Counsel at Brex, Venture Capital Investor, and founder of the big, the Black Big Law Pipeline, Black In-House Counsel Group, and 1844. A little bit about Conway. Conway is a fintech product lawyer for one of the top fintech companies in America, Brex, which was ranked number two on CNBC's 2023 Top 50 Disruptors list of innovative companies advancing breakthrough technology. In addition to his work at Brex, Conway is a venture capital investor in black and brown startups and is the founder of several nonprofits with focus on positive outcomes for black lawyers. And I know this because I sit alongside him on many of those initiatives and organizations, and I'm happy to do so. Conway, welcome to the Branding Room Only podcast. So great to be here. So great to, to be talking with you, Paula. Thank you. So the first question I have for you is, what does personal brand mean for you? How do you define it? Yeah, I think personal brand, I think most would agree, is this is what people are saying about you when you are not in the room. Mm -hmm. And especially in those rooms where you are hoping to have some influence. That, that's really what, how you should think of it. It's like, what, can I, what would people know about me? Just how would they describe me? How would they advocate for me or not right. when I'm not in the room and decisions are being made? Mm, the advocacy piece is such a huge part. We know this because we have been in some of the rooms where people are being discussed. And also we have heard about when we have been discussed in some of those rooms as well. So I think that was a spot on definition of, of personal branding. So tell me then, how would you describe yourself in three words or short phrases? Yeah, I think. I will defer to how uh, I have heard others describe me, which mm -hmm. is as an investor in others. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll say an investor, a connector, because I've often developed the brand of just really connecting people to each other, to issues, et cetera. And then a champion, champion for my friends, champion for causes, champion for those who don't have access. I love that. I will also add as your friend that you are really smart. <laughs> I'm taking that one too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. It it for me when I think about those, and I think that you hit them right on the head. So using other people's reflections and you make sense. As somebody who knows you and I've known you for a long time, it is I always think of you as, oh, what happened? Something happened in the news today. Let me see what Conway has to say about it. <laughs> which which is helpful to me because I definitely, particularly with the Supreme Court. I just don't want to read the things, you know, it's just a lot. Oh, I, I know. Lot. I know. Listen, <laughs> you and me both. We, yeah. we'll, we can touch on that some more in, in the show. Yeah, I got some thoughts there. I so. bet you do. <laughs> all right. So before we jump into all of that, tell me, do you have a favorite quote? I do. And so, as you know, I'm, I'm a Morgan Stanley alum. And if you have any, any Black person from Morgan Stanley, then you know and are definitely familiar with the great Carla Harris. She is a legend, to say the least, at Morgan Stanley. And one quote that she says often in her in her Carlos Pearls that sticks out with me is, "Perception is the co-pilot to reality." Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. whatever people think about you, how they perceive you, that has a very strong tendency to shape the reality in which you find yourself, in which you find yourself, especially as it relates to others. Yeah, which is, I mean, when I mean, we're thinking about personal brand, which makes total sense too, right? Because it's how you're being, it's those rooms that we were talking about, right? That's and, right. And so, That's right. Okay, I love that. Okay, on the flip side, what is your hype song? And let me give you a little, like what a hype song is for me. It's either what you are hearing in your head when you're walking into a room where you know you need to like kill it. Or if you don't feel good, you need to hype yourself up. What is your hype song? It might be the same or it might be two different songs. Which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
my, my hype song. I have my family hype song. And then I have my, like you said, when I need to get into killer mode uh, mm -hmm. hype song. And so with, like for my kids, for my, my wife, my family, I, it will be happy by Pharrell. But when, uh, when I need to go into killer mode, it is Ryder by Tupac. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can see both of those. I thought we were going to come with like Gracie's Corner or something for the family. <laughs> 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 All right, I get it. Happy's a good one across the board. And I like, okay, very nice. Very nice. Right. Okay. So let's jump into the conversation. Tell me, before we jump into other po people and other things, about how you have built your personal brand. Like, what are some of the ways, the platforms, the networks that you've used in order to build your personal brand? You know, it's an interesting question because I never really gave a lot of thought to building my personal brand probably much to my detriment along along my career path. And I didn't really realize what my personal brand was until it was shortly after law school and a Balsa student had reached out to me. I think I was serving as the, at, at the time, I was probably one of the advisors for the Northeast Regional Black Law Student Association. And which is something that, you know, I was just give just for giving back sake. And so I didn't really put a connector to it. And then a, a student reached out to me and out of the blue, didn't really know her that well, met for a coffee and she was laid out like, Hey, I'm trying to, I really like how you are, you know, what you, your practice is at, at the firm that I was at. I'm really trying to get into that more, really looking for any career advice that you can give me. And I, it was just kind of, it was one of the first of those types of meetings that I had had and be, and the reason why it stood out for me is because I was usually the one in her shoes mm -hmm. asking other folks, hey, can you give me some career advice? And it was the first time someone had really actually asked me for career advice. And I was like, am I now that person? <laughs> is that me now? Is that my role? And it just kind of really stuck with me and, and really made me give some serious thought to, okay, I guess whether I see myself this way or not, Others are now seeing me as this person who is in a position to be able to help others, to be able to give advice. And so uh, since and I, that informed really how I ordered my steps from that moment forward in terms of like being really intentional, setting myself up to be surrounded by other people who could also weigh in on advice for mentees and uh, just really trying to pick up nuggets along the way that I think might be helpful for those who are coming up behind us. So, I mean, I love that because essentially you're highlighting the fact that you're a thought leader and a mentor, right? And it's really, number one, how we met. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. That's right. Um, yeah. So for those of you who may not know, and that's probably most of you, Conway and I met when I was the executive director of a program called PAL, Practicing Attorneys for Law Students. Again, one of the initiatives in which I was thinking about supporting Black lawyers and... One of the many um, things that you do. <laughs> right. Uh, my Jamaican flag is flying at all times. Um, <laughs> and, and you mentioned BALSA. And just for those of you who may not be familiar, that's Black Law Students Association. And NABALSA is Northeast Black Law Students Association. And NBALSA is National Black Law Students Association. <laughs> and all, all of those... Right, all the BALSAs and all those organizations are ones in which, you know, we serve as mentors and, you know, essentially... Once you have completed a step, I think you're looked at as a mentor, right? Right? Like you're looked at as somebody who's able to get to that next step. But right, right. to your point, it's one thing to be reached out to. It's another thing to sort of accept the calling and, and then start to, to your point, order your steps in order to, to, to emulate what you want folks to do. And I think that's a hard thing, particularly when you're thinking about personal branding. It's one of the challenges that I have definitely had where I'm like, I'm going to do this because I want you to also align with this, but not everybody always does those things as well. So it's all good. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. That's so, right. Right. So then, I mean, essentially, some of the platforms that you use are organizations, right? And the, the, the ones that we have been involved in, but also including your work. And so in thinking about your work, I had a memory this morning in remembering when you won the award for the New York City Bar Association, uh, another organization we're involved in. For the diversity champion, and you told a story, <laughs> and that story still sticks with me because it was a great analogy about the experiences of Black lawyers within law firms. And so, do you want to quickly talk about the fishbowl? 
Yeah, absolutely. You got to feed the goldfish, but we got to feed the goldfish. So this this was a very timely when I when I received that recognition from the New York City Bar. And and shout out to the late Jen Munoz, who was very instrumental in in making sure that I received that recognition. The uh, it came at a time where I had recently experienced career turbulence coming out of big law, and what I one of the things that that many black lawyers and any lawyers really, but black lawyers in particular will do whenever we get some bad career news is we will often just shut down and go into a silo and we don't, we don't talk about it. And one of the things that I found out from talking about it actually out and and whenever I would actually be like at a panel or what have you and mentioning it is just how many other people have experienced the exact same thing. And very, you know, people who are broke, who have gone on to very successful careers at some point or another, if you are a black lawyer practicing in a large law firm, you have probably, chances are, you have probably experienced some type of bad review, bad markup on assignment, bad something. And so it's, it's foolish to think that, that we are the only ones going through this. And so all that to say, I had just gone through something like that when I, when this recognition came about. And so it was very timely and very present on my mind where I was like, okay, it seems to me there's a disconnect between how law firms think they are doing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and then the reality that I have heard expressed by numerous black lawyers, in New York, DC, LA, Chicago, San Francisco, Houston, you name it. <laughs> Either we are all suffering from the same delusion or law firms have a long way to go on their efforts on diversity, equity, inclusion. And so the analogy that came to me at my time, at the time, my daughter, who's now eight, she was a, she was a youngster at the time, even more so than she is now. And she was watching Sesame Street and there was a goldfish episode on there and something about feeding the goldfish and kind of just connected to me and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to make an analogy about that because what law firms are basically guilty of doing is they will they will recruit black associates to their firm and i I analogize that to the essentially buying a goldfish and putting it in a fish bowl and sending it out on your counter and showing everybody and you you look at my fish bowl i got a fish here everybody check it out but you don't really feed the fish which is the which feeding here being the analogy for uh giving key assignments bringing in to meet key clients you know, giving that real substance that actually sustains and and sees a associate grow from junior associate all the way through the partnership track. They don't, they're not as at that component. They're good at bringing us in the door. Relatively good, I'll say. We'll, you know, we'll give them some A, a for effort. Yeah. You know, they, they do okay on bringing us in. Mm-hmm. But once we get there, we are a distant afterthought. And so that that was the analogy that I made to essentially law firms are guilty of buying goldfish, putting it in a bowl, and then not feeding them. And then when the goldfish die, they wonder why the goldfish died from starvation or chose to die from starvation. And so <laughs> that's kind of like the aloofness of their approach to feeding uh, young Black talent at the, in these halls of law firms. And they miss the goldfish and they lament that the goldfish is gone. But when they had right. the opportunity to feed the goldfish, <laughs> they did not feed the goldfish. And I will point out, because I, I, as I mentioned, it's, it stuck with me as a diversity consultant who works mostly with law firm. It was also sometimes you're feeding the goldfish, but not what the goldfish needs to eat. That's true. Also <laughs> right? <what you're> talking. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, well, the goldfish cannot eat chicken. Like, that's not going to work. Right, like, right, right. Goldfish food. We got to do something that's going to actually prepare the goldfish for all the things. and. So I'm glad that you were able to to retell that because it definitely stuck. And I have a feeling, particularly with what's happening in this current atmosphere, that it will stick with others as we re- retell it as well. That's um, right. I, I just thought about amplification of platforms and using your platform in order to 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 spend a, a certain message. And that's a part of your your brand too. And you just recently won an award. From the Metropolitan <laughs> Black Bar Association. Y'all, y'all don't stop giving me all these awards, man. <laughs> I mean... You know, well, we've had conversations about awards that may not necessarily have the, uh, the that I would love. But when I think about the awards that you've won and the vetting process behind the, the awards that you have been selected for, I'm very proud of, number one, and strongly okay with the, 
So you have one of them as opposed to some of the ones that are out there that are less amplifying of your brand because they tend to be pay to play or other ways that that's aren't right. actually valuing your brand in that sense. No, that's that's a and that's a really good point and something that is core to, to my philosophy. I don't I don't do the pay to play stuff. I don't need to see my name on a screen or in spotlights or anything of that nature. Like if, if somebody, if an organization like like MBBA, which I have utmost respect for, you know, wants to honor me with recognition, absolutely. That's that's a whole other story. But I think I think as attorneys, we can probably kind of get a little too wrapped up in in the ego mm-hmm. of to see our name out somewhere. So we do all this pay to play and and self select things. I think that kind of can detract and and not exactly. Uh, you know, Seth, Seth, when you're talking about branding, you know, you want to be known. What the question is really what do we what do you want to be known for? Mm-hmm. Do you just want to be known, period, you know, for famous for famous sake? Or, you know, do you actually want to be known for something worthwhile, you know, meaningful? And I think that that's really how I look at it, which is, you know, look, it, it's a great honor to be recognized by the peers who I respect. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, I'm the I'm the last person you're gonna see, you know, shelling out cash uh, <laughs> just to just to see my name on on a you know website somewhere. Yeah, no, it's it's important, and you know, I think that both you and I have got gotten asked this question a lot. Like, it, this is something I should invest in because it'll help my brand. And and right. essentially, what you just went through is what we tend to recommend, right? What's the organization? What's the process? Right. Do you have to pay to play? And if that's the case, then you want to think about who else has won it. How have they shown, you know, there's a lot of things that can go in, into that. But really, it's not just having your name out there. It's having something underneath the wrapper, right? It's having some Absolutely. substance underneath there. So I'm glad we delved into that space because, you know, that's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> <It's just like, laughs> I'm just going to create my own award and be like, you could won the Paula Award. Right, right, um, right. $12,000. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So tell me. And this is an interesting question, given that I know you, I want to see what your thoughts are. How has your brand evolved over the course of your career? Yeah, so I think kind of going back to the the initial story I was telling about, you know, the the junior attorney or the law student rather who who, who reached out to me when I was a junior attorney. Mm-hmm. It, my brand has evolved in terms of how I see myself, you know, mm-hmm. and that's, and that's largely informed by, like I said, like how others will see me in, in that space, because I, I fortunately or unfortunately, I just have not, I didn't really always start out seeing myself, you know, in, in like anything, like there was anything spectacular to anything that I was doing. I, I saw, I'm the, and to get a little, a little background on that. I'm the oldest of six kids. Mm-hmm. And so in my household, when my younger siblings messed up, I'm the one who got the whooping. Uh, I'm the one who got held responsible. You know, whenever they didn't do their chores, it came down on my head. And so I, I made it a point to make sure I got my younger siblings in line like like boot camp. Because out of, out of pure self-interest, Paula, out of pure self-interest, because it was making my life easier. I'm yeah. like, look. You guys are going to do the dishes and we're going to mow this lawn and we're going to go out here. We're going to rake up these leaves and we're going to do what we got to do before dad gets home because yep. I'm tired of hearing about it. And so this is what we're going. And so, you know, in doing that, I've kind of I didn't realize at the time as a, as a youngster. But, you know, that was that was like, again, some many ways, like servant leadership of, yeah. you know, making sure I was holding be, being my, my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper and, and holding them literally accountable. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, stepping into doing that, I, I have a tendency to do that in spaces wherever I go, whether mm-hmm. it's at my companies where I work or in the organizations that I'm a part of. I'm the type of person I'll come in and I will see a, rec- a problem that we all recognize. And my first instinct is, OK, let's how do we go about solving this and how do I go about empowering the people around me mm-hmm. to collectively solve this, whatever this, the problem may be. Mm-hmm. And so. This is a long winded way of me answering your question of how my brand has evolved, because I would say that's been the one through line from childhood to adulthood of, of the way that it has made, stayed the same. But it's, it's certainly evolved in the sense that my platforms, you know, grown in, in, in influence and size, you know, I've, I'm more involved in, in organizations. I would say one thing that it has that I've noticed, and this came from the late Charles Ogletree. I had run for national 
chair for the National Black Law Student Association. So the so the chair of the of the national body. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was unsuccessful at my campaign. It was a very, very close, close race. It ended up coming like in second at that. But, you know, no, no prizes for second place there. And so there I was feeling sorry for myself, sitting on the side after the elections had happened. And Charles Ogletree was there and he'd given some remarks at, at the event. This was in Washington, D.C. around circa 2006. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he, he came up to me afterwards and was like, hey, you know, was really impressed with, you know, how you conducted yourself. And, you know, we had a really nice one-on-one a long conversation about you know, leadership and what it means to step up and have impact. And one of the things that he told me that's really stuck with me is that you don't need titles to be able to impact and raise up our community. You don't to have an impact on our, our community. You don't need titles. And I, that's something that it, it was a evolution of my thinking because here I was thinking, you know, the only way that I could make a difference was to actually get the title. And there I was on this eve of defeat from from having, you know, lost this, this bid. And he was like, yeah, look, I get that. But he's like, you're clearly somebody who is committed to helping our people. And I see that. And you should continue with that. You don't need a title to do that. Uh, and so that's one of the things that has always stood with me uh, mm-hmm. since that moment. And that happened to me when I was a, a 2L in law school. And so coming into the practice after graduation, coming into the practice, uh, that's kind of a, a bit of theme of how I've evolved and how I look at, at being involved in organizations. I really don't get a lot, get really wrapped up in you know, having titles and organizations to the extent that it's necessary to get like to break up log jam and get things moving. Great. Yeah. Understand there are organizations like MBBA or the MBA where like that is a it's very structured and there, there's a, a lot of impetus put on that. And I get it. And that, that makes sense. But I tend to gravitate more towards organizations like, you know, My Brother's Keeper, My Sister's Keeper, mm-hmm. like what we do in Black Big Law Pipeline, like what we do in 1844 and, and other groups where there's, there's no titles. We're just out here having an impact. We're, yeah. we're doing it because it needs, we're doing the work that needs to be done. And you know, no one's claiming credit. So we don't care about credit. It's all about, hey, who, how can we impact other people's lives and, and lift each other up as we climb? It's literally one of my favorite words. The word impact is always on my vision board. Even if that's not my word of the year, it's always someplace. It's something that my mother would always sort of instill in me. It's, like, it's, it's not, to your point, who's driving the car as long as we all get there, right? Mm-hmm. You, I can give directions from the back. I can be on the side. I can, you know, there's ways for us to get there in that same space without being the driver, without being the leader. I love the leading part, though. But <laughs> yes, but, and you're very. I mean, you're good at it. <laughs> but but to that end, it's true. You know, I always say that you don't have to be a leader only from the front. You can lead from any, any right. place, and in that fact, you can have more power in that sense as well because you're not so many eyes aren't on you. You can get a lot more done. <laughs> so, great, great response. So recently, when I was, I guess this was maybe early in spring of this year. I was looking at LinkedIn, which I love, and I look at every single day, every morning. And I saw a video that had been produced by your organization. Yes. So I was like, well, let me see what Conway is talking about. It has play. And I was shocked. <laughs> I was like, what is this? This is not true. Essentially, you talked about your experience having dropped out of school. And I was like, how have I known Conway for such a long time and did not know right. this story? And particularly because of how much success you had and how you've been, you know, been looked at as a leader, as a mentor and a thought leader, to have a trajectory in which you now have talked about failure in that one place in terms of wanting to ascend to leadership, but, but um, having diversions and, and sort of stops on your, on your, on your road to, to where you are now is an important lesson to, that people need to learn. It looks great when it's shiny, new, and et cetera, but to hear what some of the trajectory has been of folks who are on my podcast is is an important part for me. And so I'd love for you to tell the story about number one. Yeah. In a decision and then coming back to your senses and getting back online. Absolutely. And, and, and shout out to Daniel Stokes at Brex who who put that, who had the inspiration to put those videos together for the company. But yeah, I, I thought it was, would be impactful and, and appropriate to talk about that in that space because you're right it's 
we often, we don't see how the sausage is made. We just see mm -hmm. people and we can go down the list and name all the, all the, you know, the greats, you know, in our community, we only see those success stories, but we don't really see what goes on behind, you know, what did it take to get there? And so for me, it was a very pivotal moment when I was 16 years old and my dad and my mom split up. And as I mentioned, I was the oldest of six kids and my dad's from Nigeria and he went back to Nigeria at that point when I was 16 years old. And I never returned to the United States. Wow. And that was a very, very tough time. I was a sophomore, yeah, sophomore in high school at the time. And my mom and my stepmom were still back here in the U.S. were, you know, facing some really tough financial times, trying to raise the five, the six of us. Mm -hmm. And... So I thought in my 16 year old infinite wisdom that the best way to do this would be to drop out of high school and start working immediately so that I could start helping pay bills around the house. Mm. And so I, I did that, dropped out after like, I think it was my, what did one semester of sophomore year mm -hmm. and started working at, at the only jobs that you can actually work at the age of 16 without a a high school diploma, which is basically fast food. <laughs> and so there I am. My first job was actually a Sonic drive through I don't oh know. Oh my if gosh, it, Sonic. <laughs> hooking up those number one and number two burgers, <laughs> dropping them fries in the, in the hot grease, the hole in the pond, <laughs> coming home every day, smelling like food, just, just clothes just reeked of food. And so I was doing this and then, and then got a, what I thought was a, a, a career advancement where I, I left Sonic and went to a fancy restaurant downtown where I was like a busboy. And so I was even even more like coming home, you know, reeking every night of, of food. But I thought at the time I made this move because I went from minimum wage, which at the time, I can't remember what it was. It was like four something an hour, y'all. Like, this and was then, in Kansas City, right? This was in Kansas City. Yeah. <laughs> then went from I went from four something an hour to like five dollars and seventy five cents an hour or something. Yeah, right. And I was like, oh, man, I'm balling. No, <laughs> and a couple of my really good friends from high school who I, I credit to this day. And, you know, we still joke about this. I, I'm still in contact with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they came to my job. They came to my job. After I'd been working there for a couple of months, came to my job. This was like right around the, when we were about to, I think the summer had just hit and they had just finished what would have been my end of my sophomore year. And they came to my job and, and on a mission. Little did I know. I thought they were just stopping by the shop. And uh -huh. They came through like, hey, man, what's going on? You know, we dapped up for a minute, did a little small talk. And then after a while, you know, one of them was like, listen, come on, what are you doing here, man? And I was like, what do you mean what I'm doing? I'm, I'm, I'm finishing my shift. What are you talking about? He was like, no, 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 no. Yeah, we, we see that. No, I'm talking about what are you doing here? Like, what's, what, what is your, what is your goal? And I was like, what do you mean? What's my goal? Like, I'm, I'm helping out my family. They're like, all right, well, listen, Pete, if your goal is to help out your family, then don't you think you can do a much better job with that? If you actually go take your butt back to school, finish with us and like actually get like a real job where you don't come home smelling like fish grease every night. And I was like, I can't even argue with the logic of this. Yeah. And they're like, listen. Yep. And so they, they, they were there to stage an intervention. They, so they harassed me and were persuasive, got me back in. And the selling point was, look, we know you've missed the semester. We've already thought about that. We got, we can tutor you on the, there was a, like a, a test I had to take to get back on track to uh -huh. be a junior in the fall. And so the whole summer that we spent going, they, they my friends, Mm -hmm. My peers educating me on all the subject that we had missed, pre-calculus, honors English, all this stuff, taking this exam. And long story short, got back on track my junior year and finished on time and graduated with them when we walked through the high school. But I think my takeaway from that point is to be very mindful on who you surround yourself with. That is my takeaway from that list. Because if I had had friends who thought it was cool to sit around, and you know like toke every day or play playstation or whatever many things that you know 16 year old boys were doing you know in high school mm -hmm. i would not be here talking to you right now but that's just 
period point blank. Because that at the time, remember, my dad was gone and he was the main influence in my life in terms of education. And so he he was gone. So he there was no longer anyone there beating that drum. Wow. And my mom only had a high school education, bless her. Mm -hmm. uh, so she could not really speak from experience as to what college was about. She knew there was something that she wanted me to go to. Yep. But she couldn't give me the how you get there, how do you apply for scholarships, how do you do this, how do you do that. And so, but for my circle of, of, of friends back at then, I would not be sitting here talking with you right now. You know, that and God's grace, of course. Well, yes, indeed. Obviously, you know, it's, a, it's an important point to pull out here. As you go along in life, your personal board of directors, whether you call it that mm -hmm. or not, the people mm -hmm. who will come and snatch you up when you need to be snatched up, which right. you know, come, will come to the restaurant and snatch you. Um, and the right. people who you can call when 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 things are good and when things are not so good to kind of help set you straight are really, I think, the most pivotal piece of your brand, period. Absolutely. Because you can, you can say, oh, this is what I want it to be. But if you don't have folks who are actually saying, this is how it's showing up, <laughs> right? Or maybe you should do this. Or have you heard of this opportunity? You can maybe get there, but not as fast, right? And not as and not as deep as as it would be when you have a team around you. And I'm blessed that we have each other as a part of that team, and Absolutely. that we have so many other people who we surround ourselves with who are dedicated to our collective and individual success. And that's an important piece when you are thinking about building your brand. So I'm glad we kind of diverted there, but it's a perfect segue into this. Conway, tell me why Black lawyers are important to you. Yeah. <laughs> hey. How much time we got? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, I mean, so many reasons. First of all, I think even taking it out of the Black lawyer context, just Black people, period, I think are the driving force that actually makes America live up to its true values. And mm -hmm. Black lawyers even more so. From Thurgood Marshall all the way through to Justice Katanji. Every time that we see America moving forward with progress, that is typically at the behest or direct influence of Black people making, holding America's feet to the fire mm -hmm. and making America live up to the ideals that we have enshrined in those documents that we say we're going to live up to. Life, pursuit of happiness, all these freedoms that we hold dear are things that Black people have been historically in a, in a unique position to be able to say, well, hold on. You said <laughs> we're all equal. Yep. Yet here's how we're getting treated. Right. So clearly we're not equal. So we need to revisit this. And so I think Black lawyers are uniquely positioned to be able to take up the mantle in that fight. And whether, and I'm not saying everybody, if you're a Black lawyer, you have to be a constitutional lawyer. You're just your living example of success in whatever endeavor that you're in, whether it's corporate M&A or public defenders or whatever, especially on the, on the prosecution side. Yep. Uh, we need as many black prosecutors as, as possible to make sure that those sentences are being recommended fairly and equitably to all people. And so I think it's just such a, an important role that black lawyers play in the history of America. And, and, and it's that we are integral to securing America's future. And so that's why I give of my, my time, my treasure, my talent to pouring into the next generation of Black lawyers and to my peer groups of attorneys, wherever I can. My head is like, yeah, yes, all of that, everything you just, everything you just said. <laughs> because as I shape the question for you, I thought the same thing about myself. I was like, what is it? And I've said in so many different places and, you know, and use my platform this way to say, like, Black lawyers drive change. And it's not mm -hmm. just the seeing it and being like, I see it. It's a seeing it. It's a, it's a talk about it and be about it of it all, right? And Absolutely. it's the making it happen. And, and it's a powerful collective of folks. And, you know, I'm just coming back from having been at the National Bar Association Convention and at the American Bar Association Convention and understanding and seeing, you know, you're in a space where the second week as an American Bar Association, I was like, you know, there was this NBA was created because ABA would not allow black lawyers. Right. And the seeing mm -hmm. the energy around black lawyers and being in Minneapolis and going to George Floyd's memorial 
-hmm. there was so much energy around thinking and what can we do? What do we need to do? What, you know, as we go into election years, as we go into thinking about how many societal ills exist that we need to change and shift and that it is each of us individually and it is all of us collectively that will make those things happen as a catalyst. And so I'm going to jump off of this box that I always get on, but I'm glad you answered it in the way that you did because it is so important for people to realize that the more that we don't make our organizations, whether it be law firm, corporation, nonprofit, et cetera, accessible and welcoming and belonging for the Black lawyers, mm -hmm. We miss out on Absolutely. that time, talent, and treasure that you were talking about that is so powerful when ignited and, and activated. And so. Absolutely. And, and like to your point, representation matters. And, you know, and I, oh, I saw you representing up there at the ABA and I was like, that is exactly where somebody like Paula should be yep. uh, up there representing, making it very, making our presence known. And, uh, you know, that's off to you for, for taking up that mantle. Oh, no problem. You know, I love a little leadership. I love a leadership role. All right. So we kind of went into the how leadership and volunteerism have helped build your brand. Your brand. But talk to me about when you've had to pivot or shift. Mm. When it's a little something, something might have gone down or that you yeah, thought it's not yeah, working. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, listen, unfortunately, this is this is this, this can be a contact sport at times. And, and it, it's not everybody. It, my my naivete is assuming incorrectly that we all understand this struggle that you you and I have just articulated <clears throat> and that if you are in these trenches with us that you are here for the for the greater good and not for the personal and i have been fooled uh, a couple of times <laughs> when that has turned out not to be the case where people have put the personal over the group, where people are have have come has come back to bite me in a couple of organizations that I've been a part of, where uh, I did not see it coming, and I've had to pivot. I've had to pivot and, and make moves, and and fortunately, uh, you you've been with me during some of those pivots, <laughs> where we we've been in the trenches together to to make sure that we've we can keep the ship from sinking, mm -hmm. and you know I, I think it's it's. It's, I think, looking back on those, you know, it's, it's important to not let that, those type of episodes, you know, shake your, your faith and shake your commitment mm -hmm. to wanting to help others. Because that was a, that's a small you know, subset. That, that's more of the exception than the general rule. I find that most, most folk, if you are taking the time out of your busy day, to be, you know, the president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association or to, you know, lead in, you know, in any of the, the many organizations that we're a part of, um, ABWA, you, know, you name it. All the ministry. letters, every letters. You're doing, you're, doing, <laughs> you're doing all these things. That's usually because it's coming from a place of selflessness yeah. and not selfishness. And so I, I think most people, I think that's the general rule. I, both of us recognize that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's unfortunate, but you know, every now and again, you 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 want to cross folks where that's not the case, and you know, you gotta you gotta hopefully you recognize that before you 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 know give them the keys of the kingdom <laughs> and entrust them with the uh, with the leadership role. But uh, you know, if even if you should happen to be in that unenviable position, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's just important to you know, keep your keep your eye on the north star and just recognize that, like, hey, look, sometimes you gotta make a pivot. Sometimes things don't work out. Listen, listen, it might. It might, you know, cause some hard feelings for some folk, but hey, that's, that's the, I will, I will endure some hard feelings and some side eyes from some, some folks. If it means that at the end of the day, the organization endures and we were able to continue to lift up other black lawyers who need our help. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and, you know, in asking this question, I always reflect back on, on things that have occurred for me and, and, um, people who have big personalities and have platforms are often targets. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, so you, you get yourself in that space out of a place of selfishness and wanting to have impact, but not everybody can align with number one strategy and, and also with light shining. And mm -hmm. I, I recall having to like, give myself pep talks to be like, you know what, regardless of what anybody says, haters are going to hate, but you got to keep on going. And my therapist always says this, that growth begins where comfort ends. 
And so I expect to be a little uncomfortable all the time because I always want to be growing. And all of those situations, whether they are internal organization or external or, or personal, they make you grow. While you're in mm -hmm. it, while you're in it, you may not be loving it. <laughs> but yeah. as you are able to reflect back on it, it is those are the growth places. Those are the places where you're like, this sucks, but I get it. Like afterwards, like I had to go through that in order to understand the X, Y, Z thing. And so and that's a part yeah. about your, the person, your, your personal brand as well. Like it's not, it's not impenetrable, right? It should be malleable. It should be able to shift because of what you have learned. That's right. Or else you're not being responsive to mm -hmm. your, your environments and the things that people need or that you need to come out of it. So I'm glad we, we went down that road as well. Yeah, yeah. Listen, you know, like it, it yeah, adversity, you know, it, it creates, makes you stronger. So uh, like you said, I'm more appreciative of having had the experience. A hundred percent. So yeah. tell me, what advice do you have for people who are trying to build their brand? And, and I want you to, to answer this from the perspective of some, maybe some of the, the mistakes that you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so this kind of ties back to something we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, what do you want to be known for? Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you want to, what are you doing out here? And so I think, you know, follow your passions because then, because we, you know, at the end of the day, people can step out in authenticity. So you want to be your authentic self. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think everything flows from that. For me, it revolves around, I think the building of genuine relationships without the expectation of anything in return. And I think a lot flows from that. So if you're trying to build your brand, I think you know, a couple of things you want to resolve for yourself. You know, one, what are you most passionate about? Because that's like likely what you would like to be known for. Uh, and then two, nobody, you know, we have a, a saying, African proverb, that if you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. And so if you are trying to develop to the extent you're trying to develop that brand and, and be known for that, you want to surround yourself with the right people. You got to go to, you got to go together. You know, no one makes it alone. And so, you know, think about who, you know, your, the, your personal board of directors, who you want to be in, in that, because likely, you know, you are going to be the average of the sum of those parts uh, of whoever you surround yourself with. And so if they are limited in thinking that that will have a tendency to limit in, in what you see as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, a lot of attention needs, attentionality needs to be put into, you know, surrounding yourself with the right folks to follow your passion. At the end of the day, you know, this is your brand. You got to protect it. You got to, it's, it's a very hard thing to develop and earn and a very easy thing to lose. Mm. And you want to, you want to protect that brand you know, and a lot goes into it. And so, you know, give it up, give up, make sure that you are setting it up for success and, you know, the rest, the rest will follow. But I think if you can resolve those couple of things early on of, of what are you passionate about uh, and who, who do you, you know, want in your personal board of directors, I think that will, those two things above all, I think will get you to where you're trying to get to. Goodness said it better. Love that. So let's pivot as we come to the close of our conversation. Tell me about the fun stuff. Something that's interesting, fun about you, that's also part of your brand. Anything you, you know, want to share? You know, prime example, you know, I, I love, I just love, you know, seeing other people step into their value, realize their value. I love seeing that. And I love being a part of that. And, you know, shout out to Neka Uphai, my sister from another mister. You know, we, we talk about this all the time where... Uh, we literally, she texted me the other day and was like, Hey, who do we know at XYZ firm? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, there's, there's an 1844 brother over there. And she was like, Oh, great. Let's, let's, she's like, I got a client on the line. They're looking for someone at this particular firm. Let's make sure that all the work goes in through him. Mm -hmm. And this was, and this, this particular brother happened to be on the West coast. So he wasn't even awake yet. And here we were seven o'clock in the morning, New York time, already plotting on how we can make his life better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so by the time he woke up, he saw these flurry of emails and text messages like, yo, bro, us back. We, we got an opportunity for you. And so like stuff like that, where it's like, hey, you know, he had no idea waking up that morning. He was going to step into opportunity. But, you know, we made that happen. And I, I love being a part of that, that type of, of process. But to me, that's the fun stuff is where we are just out here building each other up, being each other, you know, being witness to each other's success, helping each other, everybody win. You know, we're trying to, you know, we're all in this, all in this together. And, you know, I think that, you know, people who are, are, you know, going it alone or, 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 you know, like the haters who are out there trying to tear the folks down, like it's, 
you, know, you, you went about this the whole wrong way, man. Like, like this is like, it's way better on this side. Trust me. <laughs> it's way, way better on being, oh. being on the, on, on the winning team, seeing other people shine. I think you get there by, by, you know, being, you know, a, a team player with other people of like mind who just want to see each other succeed and, you know, lift each other up as we all are climbing in this thing. So yep. I think that's, to me, it doesn't get much more fun than that. It's true. And I want to, I want to, I'll amplify that because I, you know, what the folks who are not in our circle may not know is that we take the time and we make the time mm -hmm. to get together and not yeah. just for work things, but to be able to be in community with each other. And I do think mm -hmm. that that is number one fun, but it also is a part of how you build relationships and how, you know, and doing those things without the, to your point, expectation of getting something back is such an important piece. Like, you know, speaking of NECA, who is going to be a guest on Vanity Room Only coming forward? All right. Um, um, you know, it. there was an opportunity recently and somebody's asked me who I had, you know, in mind. And I said, oh, I know the right person. And it was her. And not because I didn't know other people, but because you think about who is in the circle, what they need and what time, all of those things are important. Um, mm -hmm. And not just when things are good, but also when things are challenging, how we can support and lift each other up is such an important. Oh, yeah. Process. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. talk about that because like, Building community, it is, like you said, it amplifies the good times and it sustains you through the bad times. And if you are waiting until a bad time to start building, you know, you, you're already behind the eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> you in a, you in another country. You're <laughs> not. <laughs> it's like, oh, something hurts. I need people. And, and folks are not. They're not fooled by that. Right. They understand right. you're being transactional right. as opposed to trying to, to actually build. Um, so I'm glad that we brought that out too. All right. Ooh. So there are two questions that I ask every guest on my Brandy Woman podcast. Number one is stand by your brand. So what is the authentic aspect of your personal slash professional brand that will, you'll never compromise on? Yeah, I think one thing that I will never compromise on is my putting, putting others first. I did much to my, you know, my, my, I thought about this with my therapist often. He was like, look, you need to give yourself some grace. Like you need, you know, you hear often that uh, you need to, as they tell you on the airlines, like put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that, you know, I, I try to balance in a healthy way, but will still never compromise on is still this the desire to just want to see others succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to, in my own personal life, remember to put on my oxygen mask whenever I leave from time to time. But like that's something that, you know, for me, it's it's just kind of core to my DNA. I've realized this about myself uh, going back again to the beginning where I was talking about being the oldest, oldest of six kids. Yeah. I've been a, a teacher, a professor. You know, it's just something in me and in, in that wants to give back to others. And so that's something that I, would, I wouldn't compromise on. Love that. Okay. Similarly, but not the same, branding room only. So what is your magic? Tell me about something that's your gift, your skill, your brand proposition that a crowd would gather to see. A crowd is going to be standing room only for that thing. What is it? <laughs> I think, I don't know if I'm going to get any crowds, but I, I think what, <laughs> one of the things, my magic is really connecting people to access. And I do that, you know, without thinking sometimes just kind of like it's for me it's like breathing it's like in my dna and so connecting people to access in meaningful ways that has real impact on their lives and i'll remember stories that people will tell me at like a cocktail party about how they're trying to break into a new sector or they were just trying to get into a, a particular program where they could just you know they just want to try to get into you know, whatever it is what they're trying to get their, the door of access and i often fortunately run in a lot of circles where the, the gatekeepers to those to that access reside and so i i instinctively and intuitively i'm always on the lookout and we'll just start to say hey you know so-and-so told me the other day they were trying to get into this particular thing. And here, I just found someone who's do been doing this for 20 years. Let me, let me pair these two together with a warm intro. You know, people will just say, I've, I've, got, I've been the recipient of a lot of email intros. We're like, hey, Paula, Conway, want you two to meet. Bye. Bye. Talk, you know, take it from here. <laughs> You know, put it, yeah. when you're giving these email intros, I think it's, a, it's crucial to like, put some context to it. Put some meat on the bone. Like, hey, listen. 
this person is dear to me because I have known them for X amount of time and they are on the path to try to do this. Yes. And this other person I've known for X amount of time and they've done this and we all, we our kids go to the same thing and we do the thing. And so you're making these touch points. So it's a warm introduction for the two people who are strangers who you're introducing to each other, which will then make their meeting going forward that much more fruitful because then they have points of common. Yep. Besides just you and the introduction of the email, like they actually see that they have points of common with each other and to, you know, be able to grow from that. And so, yeah, for me, that's my special skill, my magic. And, you know, and hopefully if, if you know, I don't, like I said, crowd or no crowd, you know, that's, that's, that's where you'll find me is, is in the background, making those connections, okay. providing access to folks, you know, trying to lift us up. I would agree. I think that that is absolutely definitely a part of your magic. And from your point, I would like to just make one point that is a sticking point that I always have. When you are making intros, warm or not, please reach out to the person that you haven't spoke to to, me- to find out if it's a good time for that intro. Yes. Just send a quick text, a quick note. Hey, I want to make an introduction to somebody. Is it a good time? Right Especially point. now, post-pandemic, but still living in this crazy world. You mm-hmm. just don't know what folks are going through. That's and right. People will send emails willy-nilly and have no idea that you're about to give birth. Or whatever the thing is, <laughs> and the thing is, but I'm just like, can you ask them for a good time? Because then you don't want to seem like you are not engaging, but it may not be a good time. You could be on right, right. the But the thing is, so so you know, to supplement that, all of those things make it warm, but also make sure it is the correct time. And if it's Absolutely. not, say this is going to be better in the fall. Let's do it then. So, Conway. I knew that I was going to love this conversation and I absolutely did. And I want to thank you for being a guest on Branding Room Only and joining me and my peeps, Paula's peeps. I'm working on that. I don't know if I'm going to call them that. Anyway, (laughs) it was a pleasure (laughs) to have you here. And before we go, how can listeners and viewers find you if they want to connect with you? Well, you you know the, you know the answer to that. LinkedIn, 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, find me on LinkedIn shoot me a message. Happy, happy to chat. If you're a friend of Paula's, you're a friend of mine. So uh, <laughs> feel free to reach out. But yeah, I say it is, it is really, really good. I'm, I'm just, you know, giddy over here. Uh, just having this opportunity to make, you know, talk with you, be with you, uh, talk about something we both love talking about. We've talked about this all day. Uh, but, uh, just really happy to, you know, that, uh, you know, you are with us and, you are doing this and this is, you know, you're doing God's work. So we appreciate you and, and love you for it. Well, it's a, it's a mutual fan club. And so I will just close by saying, if you enjoyed this episode, and I know that y'all did, subscribe, tell a friend. It is important for us not to keep the things that we learn to ourselves, but to share it. And I think that was the point of our conversation is each one, teach one, and the collective success will be our individual success. So we don't got to worry about losing when we give of our spirit and of our talent and time and treasure to others. And so Conway, I thank you for doing that. And I'm going to close with just saying that I just had a moment in thinking about how important relationships are and and how you can access them and how you can amplify them. And so if you didn't hear or see from this, like this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. I knew that I could say, Conway, I would like you to be on my podcast. I know that you're going to drop some gems and I knew that it was going to happen and it did. And you need to have relationships that you can access when you need them and you need to give as much as you can whenever you can. And so with that, thank you for joining me on Branding Room Only. I'll talk to y'all soon. Thanks for listening to the Branding Room Only podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to hit subscribe to get future episodes.